25 years ago, we witnessed one of the most explosive Grand Prix in history. And even though the title was on the line, and all the buzz and stuff like that was being created before the race, as well as in qualifying, and then into the actual race itself. So, thanks to Matt Bishop for making me feel old with this one, but today is the 25th anniversary of the 1997 European Grand Prix. The narrative for this particular season was Villeneuve versus Schumacher. Williams was riding the high of the previous season, with Damon Hill finally winning his world title, and Williams was going to carry that form into 1997, with the young, exciting and 1995 Carton Indy 500 winner, Jacques Villeneuve, who was looking to do what his late father couldn't do before he was killed. Despite JV and Michael being locked in a season-long battle, remarkably they had not been on the podium together all season. What had happened was, whenever JV won or did well, Michael would retire or finish off the podium and vice versa. At the end of it all, Michael came into the European race weekend one point ahead. This being due to Villeneuve being disqualified from the Japanese Grand Prix results for failing to observe waved yellows in practice. So the title was going to be sorted out at Jerez instead. The race being held here and at this time of year for two reasons. Number one, the Estoril circuit in Portugal was supposed to be hosting the Grand Prix prior to the Japanese Grand Prix as it had done in 1996, but the circuit was in financial struggle and it wouldn't go ahead. Instead, the FIA moved the Grand Prix to Jerez, and Bernie then moved it to the last race of the season, because it was Renault's last race in Formula 1 for a few years and it would be a great send-off for them, given that Renault with Williams had been the most successful engine supplier of the 90s. Renault had won the last six seasons, including this one, so 1992, 93, 94, 95, 96 and 97 as the Constructors was wrapped up in Suzuka. Now going into the race weekend, the talk of the town was 1994, and this wasn't just a biased British media thing either, everybody was talking about it across the world. The, you know, the Adelaide collision was still fresh in everybody's mind, it had only happened, what, three years ago, and people were wondering if Michael would try the same thing if the time came to it, if that makes any sense. So Williams were playing it smart, JV and Patrick Head were dropping it into every single interview they did and every single conversation they had with anybody, just to remind everybody that when the pressure was on, Michael could and would resort to an underhanded tactic to try and win. And in practice, Eddie Irvine tried to get under Villeneuve's skin, blocking him in practice and resulting in a mini confrontation in the pit lane. Villeneuve knew what was up, and told Eddie he knew what was up. At the same time, FIA President Max Mosley was making statements to the effect of, if anybody tries to interfere with the outcome of this race and this championship, I will come down on you so hard you'll need reassembling by air crash investigators. So nobody was playing any games here. Then, 14 minutes into qualifying, Villeneuve crossed the line to set a 121.072. 14 minutes later, Michael crossed the line with an identical 121.072. With 51 minutes of the one hour session complete, Frentzen crossed the line with another 121.072. And apparently when this happened, Mosley and Bernie looked at each other and accused the other of rigging it for TV. It could have been even more shocking when Damon Hill was on a flying lap and he crossed the line 0.058 of a second off Villeneuve, but he'd had to slow down because Katayama's Minardi had been involved in an off somewhere. It's thought that if he didn't slow down, that Arrows would have been on pole. Like the previous season, when again the title was on the line, Villeneuve fluffed his start from pole position and fell in behind his championship rival. The other problem was, Frentzen had also managed to get ahead of Villeneuve and Frentzen couldn't then catch Schumacher, so in effect Frentzen was holding JV up, and Martin Brundle was making comments about the dirty air slowing Villeneuve down and potentially shredding his tyres. So on lap 8, Frentzen finally moved aside, and Villeneuve chased after the Michael. On lap 22, Schumacher pitted. Villeneuve pitted in the very next lap and that put Frentzen in the lead with Hakkinen in behind. Frentzen then played the team game, holding Schumacher up with the dirty air and Villeneuve set a few fast laps to catch up. By the time the second round of stops came on lap 43 and 44, Villeneuve was the closest he'd been to Schumacher since the start of the race. Lap 48 is the reason you're here, and Villeneuve was only about three tenths behind Schumacher, managing to hold on to front end grip through the twisty opening sector of the race. As they came down to the curve of dry sack hairpin, Villeneuve saw his chance and took it, doing a full send eye racing opening lap YOLO overtake into that particular hairpin. And as Villeneuve managed to get the car on the inside, Schumacher appeared to make a violent turn to the right and absolutely smack into the side of Villeneuve's car. It was actually a good thing Schumacher turned in. JV wouldn't have made the corner otherwise, but the commentators around the world, including Murray Walker and Martin Brundle, could see something iffy had happened. 
Now, Murray, bless him, had also been throwing shade at the broadcast directors for not showing the people what they needed to see earlier in the race. But Brundle knew instantly what was up, saying, That didn't work, Michael. You hit the wrong part of him, my friend. From the outside shot, you see Schumacher start to turn in for the corner, but he immediately backs out, only to throw the car inwards and make contact with Villeneuve. Almost like he's gone, where did he come from? And then going, not today, sunshine. Bang! Unlike in 1994, where Michael ended up in the wall and Damon had to come into the pits and retire with broken suspension, Michael ended up stuck in the gravel while Villeneuve's car continued. Villeneuve recounted that moment, saying, The car bounced up in the air, and I thought maybe the suspension was damaged, but that part of the car was fine. I was just surprised he hadn't stayed on the track. Before saying, The next lap when I drove by, I saw him on the wall and he was standing there with his hands on his hips, and I remember he was sweating. So there was a little bit of pride in that moment. Franson, who had a front row seat, was going crazy on the radio, and when he finally pitted, in his excitement, he'd accidentally stopped at the Benetton box instead of his own one you know, for Williams. But for Villeneuve, there was still about 20 laps of the race to go, and the car was... Well, let's just say he had to be super careful for these next 20 laps. The impact had smacked into Villeneuve's side pod, rather than the suspension that Schumacher might have tried to hit in the collision and the brackets holding the battery up had been broken, leaving the battery hanging loose with the wiring loom just holding it in place. If Villeneuve hit a bump too hard or rode a curb too much, the wires could have been shaken loose and he'd have lost all electrical power, and that would have been race and championship over. Hakkinen and Coulthard behind had swapped places and they were trying to catch the slowing Williams, but for Villeneuve he only needed sixth. Back then, it was 1st to 6th that got points rather than 1st to 10th, and if Villeneuve only picked up 1 point for 6, he still would have won the championship even if they'd been equal on points, because Villeneuve had won more races. And during this sort of catching up session, Patrick Head had gone to Ron Dennis and basically said to him that when the McLarens approached, Villeneuve wouldn't fight them. The problem was nobody wanted to overtake. Villeneuve was willing to let Mika go. Mika thought about it into the chicane. Mika then second-guessed it and then he went through. Coulthard was in behind as the three of them entered the final corner. Coulthard went up the inside to take second, but then appeared to slow down, with Berger doing the same thing as well. It was almost like they'd all been told of what had happened and the other drivers were trying to make sure Villeneuve won the title. Some sort of justice, as it were. Such was the confusion that DC finished only a couple of tenths ahead of Villeneuve, with Berger only a tenth behind Villeneuve. JV later said on the 20th anniversary of the race that had he known Gerhard was there, he'd have let him go onto the podium as it was his last race. But as it was, Vilna was third and also champion. The Stewarts initially dismissed the incident as a racing incident, but on the 11th of November 1997, Schumacher was pulled before a disciplinary panel at the FIA to basically explain what the hell had happened. And later on, he was kicked out of the World Championship because while the move had been deemed to be deliberate, it wasn't premeditated. So basically, Schumacher was kicked out of a championship for less than what Senna pulled in 1990. Schumacher was then slated by the motorsport press, particularly in Germany and Italy. The German publication Bild said that he'd played for high stakes and lost everything, including his reputation for fair play, while another German newspaper in Frankfurt called him a kamikaze without honour. A German sports programme polled the public and found that 68% of the people surveyed would no longer support him. Italy, though, they were apoplectic. La Unita said that he should be sacked immediately and said that he needs to face charges in the Spanish court for the grave deed he committed. La Repubblica said that waiting 18 years for a title to see it go up in smoke is bad enough. Seeing it happen because of Schumacher's move is much worse. Meanwhile, the biased British media said that Schumacher lost the right to any sympathy from now on. The BBC pointed to not only Adelaide 1994, but also the 1990 Macau Grand Prix, where he wiped out Hakkinen to win, and also the 1991 Nürburgring Group C race, where Derek Warwick almost punched him for dangerously weaving. Then there was allegations of race fixing. Now, as already mentioned, Max Mosley was going to come down hard on anybody that tried to fix the outcome of the race, and two main protests were lobbied, or two main investigations were conducted one against McLaren and Williams, and the other against Sauber. The allegations thrown at Williams and McLaren were due to the end of the race. Patrick Head told McLaren that Jack wouldn't fight them. There was no way that the FIA could prove that this was rigged to help Hakkinen win, and the switch between Coulthard and Hakkinen was done to get Hakkinen above Eddie Irvine in the driver's standings. There was also no rule saying that cars aren't allowed to switch places either. Nobody knew Hakkinen was going to win the race, so it was thrown out. 
The other was a bit more upfront. During the race, Fontana Sauber let Schumacher go through, but then held Villeneuve up for a bit longer, leading Murray Walker to say, Case of champagne from Ferrari to Sauber for Norberto Fontana, because the Argentinian newcomer up from Formula 3 really, really helped Michael Schumacher on his way there. What engines have they got in that Sauber, Murray? Isn't it a Ferrari? Well, yes, it is, Martin. You are a cynical chap. Now, since then, Fontana has said that Ferrari said, hold up JV or say bye-bye to your engines, but Peter Sauber has since denied that. Coulthard since has also said that Frank and Ron had been working together, but Ron would most likely deny it. Now, had this race happened today, we would all be saying it was all rigged for Drive to Survive, another Netflix propaganda film to keep the new Formula 1 fans happy and to keep up the illusion that Formula 1 is constantly exciting. But at the time, it was a case of that old Murray Walker adage, anything can happen in Formula 1, and on this occasion, it all happened at once. So then, a look at the 1997 European Grand Prix on the 25th anniversary. If you remember that race and you watched that race or you've learned something new here today, do leave a comment in the... Ugh. So then, a look at the 1997 European Grand Prix on the 25th anniversary of said race. If it's brought up some memories or you've learned something new here today, do leave a comment in the designated comment submission zone underneath this video. And while you're scrolling down, do give it a like and also subscribe, get that bell on and all that other stuff so you never miss out on anything I do here. Massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon for the continued support, and if you want to help out with the purchasing of these historic images, you can help out by following the link in the description, where there's also links to my socials, as well as using super thanks if you just want to top up my coffee cup or buy me a beer or whatever. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward, have a great day wherever you live in the world, and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Goodbye.